All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Yes, yes, I'm so glad to have such a, such a good turnout for our impromptu Lunch and Learn. Uh, if you are TELUS members, and um, that was a minor earthquake there. Uh, if you're TELUS members and you flipped through your newsletter, uh, yes, there was no Lunch and Learn schedule for uh, today, and we are not that smart to have scheduled an earthquake, but we thought we would capitalize on the news from last week's earthquake. Uh, the earthquake generated a lot of buzz and uh, a lot of questions that a lot of us were uh, interviewed, a lot of interest, but a lot of misconceptions too. So we thought it would be a good idea uh, to do this and get some experts to talk about uh, the seismic activity in the southeast. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things, please. If you have phones, let's get them on, on uh, mute. And uh, we do have some surveys on your tables. Uh, if you could please fill out so we can get a little feedback on how this works. So I am Jose Santa Maria. I am the museum director here at TELUS, and my job, uh, one of the things the director does is always get higher people smarter than he. Hence, we have the panel here today, starting with uh, Ryan Roney. Ryan is a geologist, and he's also the curator at TELUS. Uh, Bill Witherspoon is also a geologist and uh, formerly at the Fernbank Science Center, uh, but also very active in, in the uh, uh, interpreting the geology of Georgia in the southeast and co-author of the Roadside Geology of Georgia, probably the best book you can get on Georgia geology. And if you're interested, uh, we have them available at the store. He and Bill will be delighted to sign a copy for you after, uh, after the talk. And then we also have uh, Andy Newman, who is a, a geophysicist and seismologist, professor at Georgia Tech. So we have uh, a, a good group over here. And what I thought I would do is uh, start, the, um, uh, start the panel by giving everybody an overview of, um, um, you know, why, uh, why is this happening here in the southeast? You know, you hear about uh, horrific earthquakes in Haiti and Iran, uh, Indonesia, and then earthquakes in California. Why, why the southeast? Well, um, uh, here's a, a map that the, uh, the U.S. Geologic Survey put together on uh, tracking earthquakes in, in uh, mostly Georgia. Uh, since 1900, uh, uh, so uh, uh, more than 100 years of earthquake activity, you notice different concentrations. Uh, a lot of these in, the, in the northwest Georgia, right over here, uh, some in central Georgia. So I want to take you through uh, about a billion years of uh, Georgia history. And this, these are maps that you'll find in the mineral gallery, in our, in our touchscreen exhibit on the geology of Georgia. Uh, here's a, a Georgia geologic map. And uh, kinda, you, you, know, you go back over a billion years, you know, Georgia was part of this huge land mass that separated, that separation creates some ancient faults. Uh, fast forward to uh, half a billion years or so, you have continents uh, 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 coming to, uh, te tectonic plates coming together. So whereas now we're, uh, n we're nowhere near uh, the edge uh, of tectonic boundaries that we were at one time. So you have uh, volcanic islands, you have land masses smashing together. So I'm going to go through these real quickly. But the, the point is that all this, uh, all this colliding of land masses do create uh, faults, uh, earthquakes. That, that's, that's happening in other parts of the world where, where continents are colliding. Uh, till you get to the point where uh, uh, Pangaea is formed and you have the Appalachian Mountains, depending on who you talk to, uh, taller than the Rockies or taller than the Himalayas. Uh, now the sins has, ha have been worn, but those cracks are still there. Uh, and then even uh, afterwards when continents, uh, continents uh, separated and you have all these rifts, well th they also create uh, faults. And if you see here, during the Cretaceous, we have the southern half of Georgia, the future coastal plain. Uh, a lot of these faults were covered up, but they have been uh, detected. And so this is uh, a map that, once again, you'll see uh, on, on that exhibit. Uh, these outline the major faults, uh, including the, the Carsville Great Smoky Fault that actually is just a few miles from here, the uh, Alatuna Fault and the uh, Brevard Fault, this big line that's slashing right through this part of Georgia. City of Atlanta is right over here. The northern part of the uh, city of Atlanta uh, is, is, is built on a fault. Uh, how active they are, the major faults are actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but these, these major faults are less active than some of these other faults uh, that are creating the, uh, uh, all these um, uh, uh, seismic events. So 
Having given you that introduction, gentlemen, you have to, you want to weigh in on anything that I've discussed so far? Okay. Uh, well, one, one of the things we can say is that the, so the faults that you're talking about right now uh, are, are faults that uh, were created as part of this, right, as, as part of this accretionary, you know, accretionary ter uh, terrain uh, environment. And they are hundreds of millions of year, years old. And right then, the seismicity that we're seeing t today that you'd, that you'd shown are really not, the, we, what we see now is that we're probably not associated with these faults. Those faults are lineations that we see um, in the environment, but they're not really, uh, they're not really associated with the seismicity. The seismicity are really is new, new and young and sort of current, uh, it's sort of the current flavor of what we're seeing, yeah. but not associated with that basically the ancient scars of, of previous deformation. So, right. so the ancient faults are, are pretty stable. Is the newer, more yeah, recent so faults? Yeah, so some of the, the Vard faults is really a 200 million year old uh, scar of, of okay. past deformation. So it's like we have scars from the things that we we did when we were young, okay? But those are those are past and healed. So what we have here is the event that was um, recorded last week in uh, Tennessee. This is actually from the seismometer here at TELUS. And uh, these are also some other localities nearby, part of the EarthScope project, the ones that were left behind when they left, uh, when they removed the rest of the uh, seismometers in that project. So this is Lilburn and Calhoun, Georgia. Um, see what they saw of, the, of that earthquake. And so you see that delay of the P wave and the S wave. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But what I wanted to show you is, you know, we talk about the epicenter is the place on the planet where something happened deep down. So if you go to where this earthquake happened, that's what you would see. Thanks Google Maps here, Google. Um, but that's actually right across the river, the Tennessee River, from the Watts Bar nuclear power plant. So there were some people like, oh no, there's an earthquake right by the nuclear power plant. Well, those power plants are built to withstand much stronger facility, much stronger events than what occurred last week. And this is, so you see, um, so you see um, that w this proximity was there, but the danger was prepared for, um, for much higher. And here is a map of people who reported feeling the quake of last, from last week. So you talk about where it happened, but then you see where, where that feeling was, was felt um, from that quake. Did, did, who here actually felt that or was woken up? Oh, well, we got a good, good crowd here that actually experienced that. I, I Gentlemen, anybody it. here felt it? <laughs> so I woke up. I don't know why I woke up, but I went back to sleep. Yeah. I, I so didn't, so I, didn't, I didn't feel this. Now way. you know why you saw 4:15 on the clock, yeah. or so. Well, well, I also very frequently wake up around then, so I, I'm, I'm still. I, I did fill out the Did You Feel report, so I'm in there, but I'm still not sure so, why. So, yeah. So for people who don't know about Did You Feel It, you can. It, I, it's on the U.S. Geological Survey website. So if you were to search on Did You Feel It. Uh, and you get a chance to, to describe what you felt, and that's where the map yeah, like that comes from. that's where this data came from. So yeah. you can contribute to this data. This data yeah. is actually changing, and it might have been updated because this was from the day of the event, what had been reported. So I'm certain it's a I, little I more I do have an updated now. plot. It looks oh. a little bit different than that. Yeah, perfect. So one question that, that came up is that you, you see more people felt it uh, deep into Metro Atlanta, where less people felt it in Northwest Georgia. Can anybody address the, is there a reason for that? I, so I do have, I do have a plot that shows, uh, I mean, maybe we can go a little bit further with that, but particularly as you go from the, uh, as you go to the southeast, there's a lot, we, we see it a lot more than as you go to the northwest. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's largely due to the geology is what I suspect. I mean, a little bit has to do with population density. We have a lot more people, certainly, in the Atlanta metropolitan area. And we see a, certainly a large cluster, right, a lot around the Atlanta metropolitan area. But there is, and, and I think mine's a little bit more zoomed out. You can see that, that yeah. as well. Um, it, in, uh, in the eastern Tennessee Valley area there, we're in a sedimentary and a metasedimentary basin where, this, where, where the environment is a lot softer material. Um, and so softer material does have a tendency to create um, some amplification of longer periods and actually create some, uh, some uh, longer shaking, which is a concern actually for larger earthquakes. But for smaller earthquakes, um, you, it, it's really not that big of a thing. But what, but in Atlanta and to the southeast, what we're sitting on is actually uplifted 
deeper metamorphic rocks that were created at 15 to 20 kilometers depth. And this is very strong, and tectonic rocks, very strong, very crystalline rock. And so that earthquake, as it, as it moved through, just shook us pretty, I wouldn't say violently, but gave us a nice, good jolt, okay? And so we felt that some of us woke up at 4.15 not knowing why we woke up, but it gave us a nice little shake. And so I believe that's why it really lit us up, yeah. uh, particularly towards the southeast, basically when we jumped over, essentially, you know, the Great Smoky Fault. Into the Piedmont and yeah. such. Very good. So um, we'll talk more. This is just all the earthquakes that have happened since the 1700s in the, in the central and eastern U.S. And, and, and so you can see how, where that, and that arrow is pointing to the, where the earthquake happened last week. And it's in a region where there's been a large number of small earthquakes. It's not um, an area where it's unheard of to have an earthquake. Um, so that's, and we'll, we'll address more about why that risk is there in that area. That, you can see there's that brighter area around that arrow. That's the Eastern Tennessee seismic zone. Um, but you can also see um, on the western side of Tennessee, the uh, uh, New Madrid fault area. I mean, you can also see, actually the, that arrow on the map goes right over the Charleston um, seismic zone also. So there are various seismic zones in the, in the southeastern U.S., some um, as a result of past, uh, you have the history of the, the past affecting why that forms now, but it is modern development of, the, of that, like you said. Um, so then, this was the, my favorite joke I saw about this event. Uh, um, so, just, you That's know, they're, they're small, you're going to feel it, but again, <laughs> the okay. bigger events would be, be, be dangerous, so. Yeah, um. and, and it'd be good to <laughs> emphasize now that uh, even though this is big news, it's a 4.4, 4. Uh, 4. 4, uh, I mean, this is the biggest earthquake we have felt here in uh, 15 years since the uh, 4.6 uh, earthquake in Fort Payne. Yeah. So most of, the, what the, most of the earthquakes that actually do make the news are twos and 2.5s, thereabouts. Yeah, like the, the 2.7 that was in Calhoun a couple weeks ago. Some of the people here felt it, and if you did, also report that on the Did You Feel It? Because a lot of those, you don't get as much data on. So if you're near a smaller quake that you still felt, that data is useful to see who actually is experiencing those quakes. So let me defer it out to you, Bill. Okay, thank you. Let's see, this is next, yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't realize that was still on there. Yeah, yeah. so this, this is part of a talk that I, uh, I gave um, in uh, uh, several, several places, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Bill Witherspoon, I'm one of the authors of Roadside Geology of Georgia, and uh, whenever I, I do a lot of programs for the public, this was one of them, um, and whenever I do programs, I like to, I have a little guest book, so I'm gonna send this around, uh, and it's, it's just got your place for your name and zip code, and then um, if you would like to get the e-newsletter, then you can put your, your uh, email address, otherwise don't need to put anything there. Anybody already get the e-newsletter, my e-newsletter, e who's here? Yeah, so some people do, so, so, uh, so if you don't uh, and you'd like to get it, I've got programs every, every uh, won't come out more often than once, once a month, but I, I send that around. So, so um, yeah, so this, this is, um, uh, uh, so I did a, a talk about geologic hazards in Georgia. This is not the same one that I, I had sent you. So I don't know if we got it. It's the same. It's, it's your slides just copied in. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. So what I. Okay. All right. So yeah. Well, good. We got that one. Okay. So let me let me go back to this. Um, so uh, I, I had some of the slides you'll see are part of a talk that was about uh, the uh, many different geologic hazards that you can have. And so, so you see earthquakes down, down this list. Some of these others are actually can be things that earthquakes can trigger. So, so there's, they're all, can all be things that could be effects of earthquakes. So you can get landslides and so on. So, but uh, we're gonna focus in on the earthquakes. And so the next, next thing I wanna show is that, that uh, this is the worldwide dis distribution of, of earthquakes. And these are all the ones that are bigger than five actually. So, so magnitude five is big enough that it might break a few bricks or something on a building that's, that's directly over. Uh, it's, and, and certainly people will feel it. Um, and so you can see that we're in an area, let's see if I can get this pointer to work, yeah. So if you look on this, on this screen over here, 
we're, we're inside of a, of a tectonic plate. The nearest plate boundaries are the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where the plates are pulling apart, and the west coast of the United States, where the San Andreas Fault has them sliding like a sliding door. And then down in the Caribbean, there's, there's a place where the uh, part of the Atlantic Ocean seafloor is tucking down underneath the Caribbean plate. So we have different kinds of, of zones, but they're all pretty far from us. So we're kind of in here, and you'll see there are not many earthquakes in here. So, so when you see that, you say, well, okay, so, uh, so maybe there's not really a, a real seismic risk. And there's the magnitude, the same map, basically, for the United States, uh, greater than 5.5, slightly different map. But uh, uh, not, not many uh, earthquakes to worry about. And yet, we have this seismic risk map that shows that that indeed we do have seismic risk. So, so there are some areas in the eastern United States, uh, and Andy uh, did his dissertation on, on, on this one, this New Madrid. Yeah, there, I get that point there. So this area around Memphis and so on. Uh, there was a big earthquake in Charleston in 1886, uh, and then there's this East Tennessee seismic zone. So when you zoom in on the uh, uh, Georgia area, you can see part of these bullseyes kind of, and so we're, we're uh, up, up in this, this area right in here. And so we're kind of right on the edge of this, this zone of earthquakes. And so if I then uh, uh, hit this, then you can see the actual quakes imposed on that. So yeah, there's a cloud of earthquakes that are running. This is called the East Tennessee Seismic Zone. It actually goes all the way from Kentucky and Virginia down to Alabama. And, and uh, Northwest Georgia definitely gets some of those quakes. Um, and so then I'm going to uh, show where the, the one that, that just came is right, should be, uh, yeah, there it is, good, did show up. So, so yeah, I'll try it again. So, so, um, so that's the one that, the, of last week and where it sits and that's, where it, that's how big the circle would plot because it's bigger than a 4.0. Okay, um, so, and, and Andy will get into some of this stuff uh, later on, you'll see some similar things. So. This is um, a, a different scale than, the, than the, uh, the Richter magnitude scale is the one that, that you're familiar with that has that we've been talking about magnitude four and so on. These, this Roman numeral scale, back up here, Roman numeral scale is um, the, um, called the Mercalli scale. And this is basically those did you feel it maps are basically trying to determine how, uh, how strong the earthquake felt to the people that were in the area. And, that also is related to how much damage it can do. So, so we have had earthquakes that had a, like uh, in 1875, there was one in this strong category, strong shaking light damage. And then this Charleston earthquake uh, in, in Charleston, it was a 10, okay? So it had extreme damage in, uh, and very heavy damage and extreme shaking in Charleston. And then uh, it, uh, in Georgia, in Augusta and Savannah, it was in this, this kind of very strong to severe category. Um, and then uh, there was one in Dalton that was, a, that was felt as, had light damage, it was strong. And uh, there was even one that was, uh, at, that was felt at Tybee Island. So, so those are kind of historical things. Okay, so, so what you wanna ask really is, you know, those are the historical quakes. How big could earthquakes get in this area? And so this is, um, so the way that geologists detect prehistoric earthquakes is by looking for traces of them in fairly recent sediments. And so I was down in the ditch last uh, March with the Geological Society of America. We were on a field trip out of Knoxville to look, at, look for these prehistoric earthquakes. And, uh, and so these people that are digging around with a hoe and all that stuff you can see, uh, what they're trying to clean off the dirt so that they can see underneath what, what's going on here. And what is going on here is that on this side, are, uh, these are actually sedimentary rocks that have been very weathered. They're very crumbly, but you can still see the sedimentary layers in them. These are ancient rocks and they were tilted up on end way back hundreds of millions of years ago. And then right next to them, they were shoved up over. This is just your ordinary, what we call colluvium, just the dirt on the surface. So they were shoved up over the dirt on the surface, and this had to be pretty recent because the dirt on the surface is much, 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 much younger than these ancient weathered rocks. And so, so we were looking at this particular fault. 
And so on this trip, we were learning about these faults just outside of Knoxville, probably about three miles from where I grew up. I grew up just outside of Knoxville. I went to University of Tennessee. And the Little River, which is the river you cross between Knoxville and the airport, actually has an island in it that only exists because there's a fault running across it. The fault has actually lifted this thing up and broken the flow of the Little River. And so this, we were really, I was really excited to hope to get to go to this, and this is what the fault looked like. And uh, however, the water was up too high and we had to skip stop one. So I didn't actually see this with my own eyes, but uh, the, the geologists are pretty trustworthy. And this looks pretty complicated, but what they're showing is step by step what happened. Here's the initial fault. Here's some digging out that the, that the river did. Here's some filling in of sediments that the river did. Here's another episode of movement on the fault. And then, uh, and then finally we get to what it looks like today. And the significance is this is they were able to date some of these sediments and tell that some of these sediments are 14,000 years old, which sounds very old, but really it's very young in terms of the geology. That means this fault is probably active today. And so now, so this other significance is that this fault had um, more than a meter of slip on it from one of these events. And when you get that much, it means that you had to have a magnitude, say, greater than six, something like that. So this is how we go back. And so this was actually funded by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that wants to know, hey, is Watts Bar nuclear built? What, you know, is it built for, for the kind of event we could expect here? And so uh, they, they uh, looked at it and they said, hey, we could have stronger earthquakes than we thought here. So this is, I just wanted to show you the evidence that we could get a magnitude six or maybe even close to a seven. Uh, out of this East Tennessee seismic zone. The evidence is going back and digging around these ditches. And there are just a few places where you can really see these sediments well, mostly on the shores of TVA lakes. So we definitely know that there ha have been bigger earthquakes in the past year. So I think that's, let's see that. Oh yeah, and so, yeah. So the, the point I wanted to make here is that the, the last point that they made on this field trip was these, this area, these stops that we took along, uh, along the Little Tennessee River and this Little River stop that I didn't get to see, we are right next to the highest part of the, of the Southern Appalachian, some of the highest part, the Smoky Mountains. The steepest stream in eastern North America is Roaring Fork that runs from Mount Lacant Lodge, where I worked as a college student, down to Gatlinburg. And, uh, and so this is very steep country. And so there's a thought that this seismic activity has something to do with the uplift of the modern Smoky Mountains. And, um, and so this, was, this is something that's been going around. This is a uh, publication, GSA Today, that every geologist gets in their mailbox once a month. And the cover story a few years ago was that maybe the Southern Appalachians are not so totally dead after all that they're uplifting today. And, oops. And so, uh, in, the, in terms of the time period could be the Miocene, and Miocene is an epoch that lasted from what, I can't quite read that, it looks like 23 to 5.3, something like that, million years ago. So, if, if, and probably still coming up. So, so this, is, this was the evidence, and this was another field trip we took when Geological Society of America was meeting in Chattanooga that year. Um, Okay, so anyway, so, so, so why might it be uplifting today? And I think you had some, well, something to say about mixed that. Mixed with that uplifting, there's other activity going on beneath the, um, the, the area of the Appalachian Basin. So just to the northwest of the mountains, you have the Appalachian Basin. And EarthScope was a project that had seismometers placed all over the country. And um, around 2014, and a couple years before then, they had their grid here in the southeast. They had worked their way from the west all the way across, and really using earthquakes to give an idea of the way the crust of the earth is built underneath, um, almost like an ultrasound of the earth, but using the seismometer data to get to that information. So here on this picture, you see that grid, and they're looking at these regions, um, and we, this, is, this is the data that is compiled and interpreted from that. Um, and there's a little simpler graphic I'm gonna show next. But on here, this map of this region, they did slices, one, two, three, and then four. So the, each of these slices, the, they, were, they were figuring out that what this image was showing in the blue 
is parts of the crust is actually sloughing off and going down into the mantle. But as that happens, we see these areas of red, which actually sit underneath the Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee seismic zone and um, the Charleston seismic zone are areas of a, a sphenosphere, which is the upper mantle that flowed in and is, and is cooling as newer rock under that area, underneath the crust. So you have a thinned crust with newer material coming up into it. And so you have this weakened crust that has allowed some of this area to, in a sense, reactivate. Um, I, this paper doesn't extend it further into any interpretation beyond what we're observing, but this is the possible mechanism for that motion that we're seeing. And so here's an interpretation of that data, and you see this bit of the, of the crust is going down and this up in the sphenosphere coming in. And so that's part of what could potentially why be causing this, this shift in what's going on and why we have these patterns. Well, we have two explanations of this recent uh, faults and recent uh, earthquake activity. Uh, any other, uh, any other reason, any other, any other explanations for these younger faults? I'm, I'm thinking. I don't, I, I've just heard one so far, which is so that there's some things going on in the together. mantle that are yeah. causing. But, but also the uplift of uh, the, the well, possible the, uplift of the, of the uplift is a result of what what Ryan's okay. talking so about. So this cooler so, material so, in the atmosphere yeah. is more buoyant, so it could be part of what's contributing. Part, to part of what's what's making the the uh, and when you look at the the the. The whole, the whole map of the, of the southeast with the, where the coastal plain comes down, it makes kind of a, a big bend around Birmingham and so on. And that's kind of the nose of kind of a hump that the whole southeast has been uplifted by this, this mantle phenomenon that Ryan's talking about. And, the, and the, you know, if this is, if this is that hump and the, my fingers are going down to Birmingham, my knuckle is like, that's the, that's the Smoky Mountains and Mount Mitchell, that's the highest uplifted area. Okay. That's, that's going on due to that thing that he's described. We'll pass this yeah. to. Yeah, sure. All right, no. oh, okay. I you know yeah. I'm going to leave those images up. Um, I mean, there have been quite a few um, models that have tried to explain eastern U.S. seismicity, and a lot of them. Uh, let's not do this one, let's do the other presentation. This is uh, three hours worth of material. <laughs> um, Anybody in a hurry? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll just, I'll just pull out a few things from this one as well. Um, and a, lo a lot of them have good things, a lot of them have bad things. The, the only, the only, my only criticism about one that requires uplift and subsidence is that uh, we don't see substantial uplift or subsidence in the eastern United States. And the earthquake focal mechanisms that we see, anything across the eastern Tennessee uh, seismic zone, don't suggest uh, any dip slip mechanism this earthquake as well as a strike slip mechanism, yeah. which, which a strike slip mechanism is like what we see, see along the San Andreas Fault, which is, uh, means that the land is moving side by side. Now, we, it is possible for something that is uplifting to transmit stresses for a field that does shift and create strike slip activity, so I'm not going to completely out, uh, rule it out. There are some other papers that have been published, uh, quite a few of them from this group in Lamont, that have been suggesting sort of this corner flow uh, motion in the asthenosphere as well that basically are driving, driving, lateral, dri driving lateral flow in, in the environment that could also stress the environment sideways. That basically, it's just a discrepancy between thin crust to thick, I mean, yeah, I mean thin lithosphere to thick lithosphere uh, environment. And that's another possibility. Uh, long story short is that I think we're not too much further than we've been 20 years ago. Uh, we have a lot better images of our, of our deeper environment. We still, uh, and we have a lot more models, we just don't have definitive answers yet. Yeah. Um, unlike what we know for plate boundaries. Plate boundaries we're doing a very good job uh, with. And this, this is kind of where, and that's what I told you guys over the phone yesterday. Uh, I did my PhD thesis on the New Madrid Seismic Zone, uh, this, and I finished my thesis in 2000. And the big result that I came away with uh, with that is that uh, in the eastern United States, uh, I'm probably not going to be able to get an answer that's definitive in my career span. So I started to move more of my energy uh, to looking at uh, 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 subduction zone environments, fleet boundaries, where we, can, we, where we can probably get much better answers. Now, it doesn't mean that all hope is lost. We are still working 
uh, and trying to answer questions in the eastern United States and other plate and carrier environments, but we're going to be able to answer questions more quickly in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the plate boundary environments. So, um, so I, on, on the way up, we were talking about this some more, and I, I did get the feeling that one thing you were able to say was that, that the risk maps that said that Memphis is the riskiest place in the country to build a building turned out to not be. Oh, that, oh, yeah, that's yeah, definitely so, the case. So, so, yeah, and the risk, the, the, and I should, I should also maybe make a, a yeah. small change in uh, verbiage. We should say hazard maps. So, yeah. as a, so hazard is, uh, is really the product of whatever the earth tells us. Yeah. Risk is actually the combination of hazard and vulnerability. So if yeah. nobody's there, no. if nobody's there, it's hazard. If somebody's there, and depending on how you're built, Oh. Build environment, it's risk. So, so okay. it's, a, it's a hazard map. So, yeah. um, all right. I'm, so, um, pe people will correct me if I if I if I, if okay. I so, so it's a hazard. So, but it's a the hazard maps have got have gotten better over time. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they have they have scaled it back uh, based on what the what, what it was assessed before I started doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, the new magnitude seismic zone, they used to think there was a risk for magnitude 8.3 earthquake every 500 years. We, we determined, apart from the work I did, that it was just impossible to fit earthquakes that big that frequently there. Um, it's in the middle of the eastern United States. We just can't do that there. Um, we can't actually fit magnitude 8.3 every 500 years anywhere in the United States. Um, but uh, what I have in this plot is a model of how plates move, um, our tectonic plates move on, on the globe, or we see the half of the globe uh, centered about, you know, a little bit over, over eastern United States. Uh, you, uh, you see North America plate moves relatively slow compared to something like the Pacific plate or even the Nazca plate, which is, uh, uh, the, which is the one that's colliding with the South American plate. The longer arrows mean they move yeah, faster? The, well, yeah, the, the size of the arrow, the size of the arrow is the, the, uh, it relates to the speed of the motion. Uh, and these are all relative to what we'd say call a fixed reference frame. And a fixed reference frame uh, would be like relative to hot spots being fixed, not moving. So you can imagine uh, um, basically the volcanoes, um, or the hot spot creating Hawaiian volcanoes uh, being fixed. Um, and so if we look at plotting, let's say, the earthquakes, and I plotted here the earthquakes since 1960, greater than magnitude 7, you know, this is kind of similar to like what Bill was showing before, you know, those earthquakes really occur at plate boundaries. So that's kind of what Bill was showing. Um, now, um, I, I don't want to give a full lecture, but um, what we see um, and what we understand for a plate boundary earthquakes are that it's that driving, the driving motion for earthquakes is really caused by that stress buildup of those plates moving and basically locking up at the interface of a fault. Um, and that basically that, that fault has a, has a is a frictional environment and gets locked up over time. And eventually that, that, uh, that fault interface will fail. And that fails, it pops, okay? And, the, the, and you have a failure across that interface. And the, 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 the amount of that failure, or the amount of that interface that ruptures the product of the amount of the interface that ruptures and the length of that fault, that, uh, the, the, or the amount of that slip that, uh, that ruptures, gives you a size of an earthquake. Uh, so I have an earthquake machine here, and if I have a volunteer, or particularly a younger volunteer, I'll create an earthquake or two. So do you guys want to, okay, have a, or you have a hand up, okay. So your job is to run plate tectonics, okay. It's a pretty big job. So can everybody see me? Okay, more importantly. So all this is, so you're gonna do, you're gonna move this at the rate of plate, plate motion. You're just gonna keep moving this. Just keep there are plenty of seats right here if anybody wants to come up and see this Just keep this constantly. Okay, you go ahead and start. Don't go too fast. Okay, that's good. And all this is is frictional tape, okay? And Keep cranking constantly, and there's just basically a big rubber band. Stand to the side a little bit, just in case it snaps, it doesn't hit you. Stand this way. There you go. I'm gonna scoot this over. Come on. Keep cranking. 
Oh, what's your name? This is Todd. Okay. We just had an earthquake. Okay. So we had a pretty big earthquake. It was about 70 centimeters. 70 centimeters is probably about a magnitude 6.5. So you just created a 6.5 earthquake. Okay. Now, it wasn't really dependent on how fast Todd um, moved. Now, the rate of which the earthquake would have recurred is dependent on how fast he moved. Uh, what's really dependent is how strong the environment is. Now, I just moved it. I just turned this, uh, this uh, surface over to another side. Uh, do, the, do the same thing again. Now, he's going to load the fault again. This, the, the rubber band here, uh, is a characteristic of how strong the earth is. Uh, crustal environment is between 30 and, f 30 and 50 gigapascals. Keep going. You notice we had a much smaller earthquake. That was about 10 to 15 centimeters. That one was about 4 or 5 centimeters. Okay, he's creating a lot of magnitude 3 to 5 earthquakes now. Okay, keep going. So he's a very different fault environment. Okay, the only thing that I've changed was actually the fault frictional interface. Okay, you can keep going. All right, maybe we can stop now. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Okay, everyone want to give him a hand of, uh, round of applause? All right, thanks, Todd. All right, so that's essentially what we know about earthquakes. Okay, and uh, we know that quite well for plate boundaries, and we do this in plate boundaries. Uh, we're, this is actually a big piece of what I do, as I use GPS now, to map out where on plate interfaces those places are locked up. And we can map that out now to I identify, particularly I do this in subduction zone environments, try and figure out wh how big these earthquakes are going to be and uh, where they're going to fail. Um, this does not work in the eastern United States or in plate interiors because we don't see, okay, that plate, we don't see the plate ba that basically you know, Todd cranking that wheel. We don't see that in you know, a vector that I showed you before. Okay, those, arrow, those arrows moving uh, on the plate interior. The arrow that, sorry, I can't, wrong button. Okay, um, that arrow that I'm showing you right here, difference between an arrow here and an arrow which I'm not showing you right here, right here would be essentially the same. And that's what, we're measure, what we measure when we show GPS in the Eastern United States. They all look the same, so we don't see, you know, any difference in that, that crank being moved. So we don't really know what's loading those environments. Okay. Um, let me, and I have a bunch of other slides here talking about different earthquakes, and I can go through some of those. Um, let me get to specific things about things in the eastern United States. Um, but what we can do, and this is what I was talking about with Bill in the car, uh, we can look at just some good old earthquake statistics. And this is what we actually have been doing. This is what uh, a lot of our earthquake hazard maps are built on, are just using basically the past information of what, uh, what we see from small earthquakes to make an assessment on the future potential for large earthquakes. And so uh, earthquakes follow a, what we call a power law. Um, and we're pretty used to these power laws, and we've heard about these sort of power law things uh, when we think about floods. So how many of you have heard of like a 50-year flood or a 100-year flood or a 1,000-year flood? Okay. So the same thing with earthquakes. Okay. Uh, earthquakes, we say that uh, for every magnitude 5 earthquakes, we can expect 10 magnitude 4s or 100 magnitude 3. Okay, so that's what a power law distribution means, is that, um, that the, as you increase in size, you're going to fall off in uh, frequency, or if you decrease in size, you're going to increase. As long as you don't change the, basically the physics of the problem. Uh, and so a lot of natural phenomena uh, do this. So uh, flooding does this, you know, earthquakes do this. Even the branching of trees do this to a certain degree. Uh, meteors, uh, as a size of meteors, as they uh, uh, hit the earth. Uh, so, wrong button. So, if you look at the 
if I, if I look at Georgia, and if I look at the earthquakes just boxing or surrounding uh, the environment of Georgia, if I was to look at, let's say, the 4.4 earthquake that hit us right now, and I made this plot a little while ago, so this isn't, isn't the most up to date, but if I was to follow that distribution over time, I would expect that 4.4 in the entirety of the southeast of Georgia, let me just follow this a little bit better, it should on average actually hit us about once every 10 years. And we haven't had one, we said, for about 15 years now, so on average, that's about right, okay? Now, it's only an about average sort of thing. But what we can do with that, I mean, you can see this, these numbers fall off really well, go down to a magnitude three, okay? Magnitude three, we could see we could actually get, you know, that little bit less than once a year. We actually see, you know, I think up to, I think about 3.2 or so every year. But we can extrapolate those numbers to start considering the potential for really large earthquakes. You know, so if you really want to know what is the potential in our nearby environments to be affected by really large earthquakes, well, you can start saying, well, what is the potential for magnitude six? Something that's actually potentially really destructive in our environment. Uh, well, we have the potential for a magnitude six every hundred years in our uh, in our environment. That's actually non-zero, okay? That's, you know, most of us are going to live on the order of 80 years, okay? So that means that we have a real likelihood of a magnitude 8 earthquake in our environment. Uh, and a magnitude 6 earthquake in our environment, sorry, in, in 80 years. Um, and a much lower likelihood of a magnitude 7. Where? I don't know. Eastern Tennessee, maybe. Charleston, maybe. Atlanta, probably not. Uh, we have very few earthquakes in Atlanta. So the Charleston earthquake was roughly within the 100 year span? Well, Charl uh, this, is, this is long, Charleston is not in this plot because I did this plot using earthquakes since uh, between 1962 and 2008. Okay. Uh, but uh, if I was to go back, you know, I mean, if I was, Charleston would fit in that, in that plot going back a little bit further than that. Charleston, now the magnitude for the Charleston earthquake is probably 6.7 to 7.3, we don't exactly know because the Charleston earthquake was before the modern seismometer was invented and there's a lot of debate as to the actual size of the event. Um, there's a lot of soil amplification in the, in the region, so it had a very regional, as, as Bill's pointed out, regionally the intensity and magnitude of that, uh, the, the intensity of the, uh, the event was up to, uh, up to a 10, uh, but it was sitting in a very sediment-rich environment that absolutely destroyed the, the, uh, the region. <coughs> no. I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so here's another plot of earthquakes. We showed a few of these. Actually, have um, so actually this is actually a really beautiful plot for the Charleston earthquake. One of the things that we also see, which we haven't talked about so much uh, yet here, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the extent of shaking that we saw from the 4.4 earthquake. All the way across the eastern United States, we see small earthquakes so much better than many other places on Earth. Um, partly, we used to say it's just because we are less fractured rock, but we actually have a relatively thicker continental uh, precon as well. Um, well, actually, uh, further further west, uh, but we, uh, 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 which is west of the Appalachians, uh, we bigger earthquakes get uh, uh, rung further as well. But the Charleston earthquake, no matter what the magnitude really was, one thing was quite clear. You know, before the days of Twitter, okay, uh, there was still a very fast signal that was sent all the way across the eastern seaboard. Uh, from this event, and that was the, the P and the S wave, and I guess even the surface wave of this event. But that event was sent, and uh, the signal from that event was sent to, I gotta press the right button, was sent to Chicago, to even Milwaukee, to New York, to not quite Boston, but to Connecticut, Long Island. That event was felt everywhere, almost everywhere across the eastern United States. It wasn't substantially felt, it wasn't damaging people there, but it was, it was felt. It, now, the Charleston event, which we don't know exactly what the risk is um, for, or, the, or the hazard is for a repeat of that event today, uh, but those of us in Atlanta and in Georgia should be still somewhat concerned because that event that occurred in 1886 was an intensity level seven throughout the entirety of 
eastern Georgia. So an intensity level seven, I, I can't read that here, but maybe you guys can read it up here. That is felt by all, many are frightened and run outside. Some have a, have a, um, some heavy furniture is moved. Uh, for instance, is, uh, oh, it's really hard. A few instances of plaster damaged uh, and, and uh, damaged chim uh, uh, damage chimneys, uh, damage is slight. Um, sometimes, uh, so, you, so, you, so old houses, things that are 100 year old houses, you're gonna start having failure of uh, chimneys and the likes. Uh, so you're going to actually have some, uh, you're going to have the point where you're going to actually have uh, costs associated with that. Okay. Um, so so yes. having established, you know, the potential for wh wh whichever you call a hazard or risk, I mean, when we're building buildings here in Atlanta, for example, I mean, is that taken into account? Are architects or structural engineers taking into account the possibility of even a minor earthquake? In, in the construction and design process? Um, so, for, so for modern building design, for, uh, for modern, um, so I, I'm not an earthquake engineer, but for modern building design that there's uh, most code is built for, uh, for quite a, uh, has a, quite a few things that are established within it, but most design now has requirements in it that, um, that will, Take, that will uh, uh, will be will, will will allow your house to stand upright and not have substantial damage for smaller for small earthquakes. That's for new building. Uh, but a lot of us, I don't know about you, but I, I live in an old house in Atlanta, and I have an old chimney that's not going to deal well with a uh, um, uh, with a uh, with a uh, with a with a, with a uh, with a magnitude four or five earthquake right under Atlanta. Right. I guess the flip side is, if you have an old house, it has survived the number of earthquakes already. Mm -hmm. It it might. It, it, it depends, it, it on, might it depends on where the earthquake is. And that's I have a plot right here, um, and and it just depends on what how big the earthquake is and where you are. Um, and this is kind of what I was going to start alluding to. And I, I, as I was mentioning before, I'm trying, I don't want to be a harbinger of doom because we are, we are, in all likelihood, we're not going to have a big devastating and damaging earthquake um, in Atlanta. But there always is a potential for something bigger than we ever expect. Um, 2003, there was an earthquake, which is not that large, the magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake that occurred in, um, in uh, Iran. It's called the Bam earthquake. Um, Thirty to 40,000 people there were killed. Um, and it's partly there were so many people that died in this event uh, because a lot of them lived in buildings like I was showing uh, down below uh, that were extremely old. You know, a lot of them were built in six, 16th, 17th century, so we're talking about four or 500 year old homes um, that stood for so long because they haven't felt shaking in so long. Um, now, this is a mountainous environment, you know, that you would expect, well, you know, you, they would probably have earthquakes all the time. Now, yes, there was a magnitude 7.3 earthquake that, you know, occurred 100 kilometers away, but that was 100 kilometers away in another fault. But that, that zone right there had not had shaking in so long. And so we see places like this all over the place. Uh, the eastern United States is kind of like that. We have bullseyes on the map where we see recent earthquakes that have happened or recent not I mean, not even large earthquakes but recent zones of seismicity or current zones of seismicity we have a lot of places where we just don't see events right now at all that are completely aseismic um, there are possibilities of events that pop off in places that are completely aseismic that are outside of these bullseyes on the hazard maps um, and we just we are we are we are completely uncognizant of those, and that's why I have this plot. And I don't know if many of you know of this uh, uh, of this statement. Uh, so Donald Rumsfeld was a Secretary of State uh, a, a while back, and this is probably the uh, probably the, uh, the the best thing he, well, to me is the best thing he's known for. Uh, but it's a statement he said. It's called the unknown. It, it's actually it's it's quite it, it's actually quite. Uh, it's quite bright in what it says. 
Uh, it says, as we know, there are known knowns. Okay? These are the things that we know we know. Okay? There are also known unknowns. Okay? These are the things that we know we unknown. So this is how we can quantify uncertainty. There's also, okay, um, that there are also unknown unknowns. And these are the things that we, uh, we don't know we know. Um, these are the things that we don't know we don't know. Okay? And th this is where we really are with Eastern U.S. seismicity. Okay? Our Eastern U.S. seismic maps are based primarily on where we see small earthquakes right now and earthquake uh, and some earthquake, large earthquakes that we've seen in recent U.S. past, uh, where, where, we, where basically we've had larger earthquakes since we've moved here. But uh, places like China, um, where we have a really long earthquake history, we know that earthquakes turn on and turn off with recurrence times of 500 to 1,000 years, where they can be completely quiet for extremely long periods of time. Okay? So in the Eastern United States, it might be something like that as well, where we just don't know where, you know, in these hazard maps, where, uh, uh, where, where other things are. I have some other things on, uh, on hazard well, stuff. I'm not gonna talk that's about. like a good spot to round out. With. Sure. Well, actually, I, one more thing I wanted to do is that what to do during an event. Oh, very important. Do you think that's a good thing to do? And then sure. Okay. Okay. How many, okay, actually, maybe I you go back for that. How many of you know, I had it up there for a second. How many of you know what to do during an event? What do you do? Okay, great, okay. And you okay, the tape great. I, I, I was hoping you didn't say go into the doorway. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, because they used to be said that you go into a doorway, which you don't do, okay. The, um, the current thing that, what we, that we're teaching is drop, cover, and hold on. Okay, so the idea of going into the doorway is really a, mis, uh, a misrepresentation. Uh, basically, if you, uh, from some really old, uh, basically there was, a, there was an earthquake that happened in Southern California, from an old school, old adobe schoolhouses, uh, where just the doorways were left standing, uh, but it's because the schoolhouses were made from adobe brick, and they had no wood infrastructure whatsoever and the doorways were the only things that were wood. So if you're in an old adobe schoolhouse that's only made of adobe and has a wooden <laughs> doorframe, maybe do that. Um, but for the most part, doorways are where there are a lot of things on facades that can fall down and it creates a lot of chaos. And if it's a strong enough earthquake, it's really hard to run. So um, what we say now is if you're, if you're in the middle of an earthquake, what you should really do is you should drop to the ground immediately, okay? It, it lessens your chance of falling. Okay. Cover yourself with whatever you can, a table or a chair. Sometimes the chairs are really, uh, really hard to do, but usually a table or a desk. And hold on through the shaking, okay? And this is really important because if you're just underneath the table, even if it's just the first part of an S wave, you may think you're okay and things, are, you know, things aren't moving that, 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 that strongly. But the later part of the surface wave may be coming through and things are going to get a lot worse really quickly. Um, and that table may move out from over you, okay? So if you're holding on, you're gonna move with the table, okay? So drop, cover, and hold on. <laughs> um, I won't make you do it like I do with my class, but remember, drop, cover, hold on. Sorry. Great, great. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir. I guess the question is, do any of us have um, earthquake insurance in our homes? Yes. That, and depending on where you check. live? <laughs> I'd have to check. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not aware of any. Okay. Yes, I live in a 55 community, and people claim bridge is a quilt, and they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a slide That's on good. insurance. I, I used to work, uh, I actually worked for a reinsurance company a long time ago while I was getting my PhD. Um, and um, I will not tell you to or not to get insurance. Important things with insurance are always peace of mind. Um, California, right, insurance, earthquake insurance is gonna be a lot more expensive than in Georgia, obviously. Generally, earthquake insurance cut, takes, uh, um, picks up at usually about 20 to 30% damage on your home. 
Um, and so it depends if you have a bigger if bigger damage then you know then, then it's going to be uh, more valuable for you it just it depends on what the level of insurance is so they usually have really high deductibles, high deductibles but they're probably going to be relatively cheap in your environment um, so it really depends on what how important peace of mind is for you so the, the important thing is for you here is that insurance companies and reinsurance companies also employ Okay, scientists like they employed me a long time ago. Okay, to do the very best they absolutely can to get the best numbers they, they can to assess what the true risk is of your environments. Um, so they really want to know how risky your environment is, and then pay for those people, pay for the overhead, you know, and then try and make a profit. So that they're doing all that. At, um, to try and, 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 and to cover then that and then and you're trying to do that with your peace of mind so I'm not going to tell you to or not to do it but it, it may be safe to say that in a low risk uh, uh, environment the insurance may be inexpensive if it makes you feel better get it okay. uh, yes Okay, so the question is, uh, in case some of you didn't hear it, does the, does the pressure from, from waves on... Uh, wait, wait. So we have wait, uh, wait. 15 inches more rainfall this year than last year. Does that cause... Okay, and, and so his question was, uh, uh, the weight of water, say, from, from uh, 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 some excess, excess, excessive rainfall, uh, does that uh, uh, trigger earthquakes? And then I will add to that uh, something we talked about yesterday, which is uh, impounded lakes. Uh, so we have new uh, volumes of water that were not there before. Would that trigger earthquakes? So we do see earthquakes. Um, so I brought up the, one of the uh, earthquake maps uh, for the region. Um, so you see the, um, you see the earthquakes mostly along the Eastern Tennessee seismic belt. You see some of those focused around Charleston. Um, but you also see another sort of diffuse seismic kind of lineation that kind of goes from Columbus through a little bit, Macon, Sinclair, up through Augusta as well, right? Um, that more or less associates along the fall line, all right? The fall line's not a fault, okay? But that is the coastal Georgia boundary back during Lake Cretaceous. And that is a topographic boundary that happens to also be where a lot of our reservoirs are, okay? And so we do get uh, we do get a lot of earthquakes around there, um, and we frequently do. Even though I have not yet been able to find a correlation exactly with that, but others have in other environments uh, have found correlations of uh, earthquakes uh, being occur uh, occurring whenever there are substantial changes in reservoirs. So if you get basically a large influx of water. Uh, into a reservoir, a large uh, unloading event in a reservoir, you'll get basically, uh, and they're not large earthquakes, but you'll get, you'll get small earthquakes that are induced in these environments. So not, not necessarily big earthquakes, but you, you do get small earthquakes induced in there. And is that due to the weight, or is that due to water seeping into the it, it's, uh, it's lubricating? It, it's, it's loading. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, the water's, these earthquakes are much deeper uh, into, a, uh, into an environment that's impermeable. And then speaking of water, uh, the uh, uh, injection of wastewater for, for uh, fracking, for example. So, uh, so that's, that'll definitely also uh, create earthquakes, uh, but these are, these are not uh, fracture, uh, fracking induced, or, which, is, which isn't really, most of the earthquakes that we see associated with fracking aren't directly fracking, they're the re-injection the re wells of the fractured water. Okay. And then you had a second question? So the question is, uh, 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 living on Carter's Lake with a, uh, how tall? 547 foot earthen dam with a 4.4, 4.6 earthquake. Um, uh, my expectation is that dam would be engineered better than. What about a 7.0? Uh, it, it depends on where the 7.0 is. And, and 
I, I, I am not an engineer, and I did not engineer the dam, and I don't know what the specs are for it. So, but if anybody tells you that dam is built on a major fault, it is. It's built on the major fault that separates the Blue Ridge from the Valiant Ridge. But as we were saying at the beginning of this, that's a major fault that's totally dead, has been dead for, yeah. for hundreds of millions of years. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, that's not part so of it's, it's not, it, as you can see from the hazard maps, it, you know, it doesn't go up because of that fault and the, they're not cluster of earthquakes along that fault. It has no, no bearing on it. Great. Back there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who else? Right over here. How intense uh, would the shaking be in North Georgia if we had a repeat of the uh, New Madrid uh, type so, of uh, earthquake, so, a major earthquake? So if we repeated 1811 New Madrid earthquake in North Georgia, um, the, I don't actually remember off the top of my head the intensity maps for, uh, for Georgia from that event. Um, so I, off the speculation, Question, would we feel it? We would definitely feel it, yeah. yes. No, we would definitely feel it. We feel, as a matter of fact, there was a magnitude 5.4 there in the, uh, what is it, early 80s or so, uh, that where it was felt in Boston. In Boston. So uh, again, we, we feel earthquakes great distance. We'll definitely feel it. Uh, I don't know if there was even damage here. There would be a Mercalli map for that earthquake. There, there, so if you, if, right. you, if you searched on Mercalli, New Madrid quake, no, no, 1811 no, no. or something, and, you would and find Susan the Mercalli map? has published quite a bit on that, but most of her focus has been actually going through basically the Ohio Valley. Uh, okay. doing, and the, the, so we don't have a map like you had for Charleston that we could see that we would answer that question with, or would we? Um, the, the real problem that I have is that most of my energy on the New Madrid stuff was done pre-PowerPoint. <laughs> so all that was on slides and overheads, okay. <laughs> okay? And when I moved into PowerPoint days, most of the stuff has been, so, yeah. So you don't have one to pull up. It, unfortunately, that, 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 this is the honest so truth. You're not sure that. whether anybody's so, done one no, or not. I, no, I have, no, th they exist. And I just, uh -huh, yeah. so I don't, have, I don't have a nice figure that I can just pull up for you. And yeah. in, in the back of my head, I don't have one that's, that I can. Uh, no, I, the thing is, I do have the, um, and I I do have um, the uh, attenuation plots as a function of magnitude, but they honestly, the attenuation plots as a function of magnitude for a given magnitude vary by an order of magnitude because we just aren't sure what the level of shaking is for an earthquake that big. And we also don't know how big that earthquake was by an order of, let's say, about a half a magnitude. What's that? Well, so there were, there, there, the thing is, in 1811, 1812, there were people here in Georgia. And the thing is, there were people here in Georgia. There were very few people in Me Memphis didn't really exist. Or Memphis was a really small town. The area around, around the New Madrid area was extremely low population density. You know, and that's why a lot, of a lot of energy was focused up in the Ohio Valley. That's where actually people were. Um, and so that's where... The, uh, Sue Hoff had spent a lot of her energy trying to go back and reevaluating the, um, the uh, paleo intensities to try and get back at a better magnitude uh, distribution for it. And most of the population in Georgia was based more to, towards uh, the, the lower Piedmont and then the and, coastal and Savannah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, oh, I see. I see. So they're probably yeah. more down there. I was assuming that there would still be. Right. I mean, you know Atlanta, I mean? Atlanta didn't exist. Uh, okay, Atlanta, you're right. Atlanta didn't exist. And I guess the, the people that were up here probably didn't have the communication. Right. Yeah. 
Correct. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're uh, really, we, we had so much fun. We were actually yeah. ran over. Uh, Canty didn't flag me. She maybe yeah, I was ignoring her. <laughs> <laughs> like, <"Yeah." laughs> but let's take one more question and then we'll wrap it up and then we'll be here afterwards yeah. if you guys want to approach us. But uh, one other question. Yes, sir. A, okay. quick, a quick definition of a S wave so and P wave. So a P wave is a compressional wave, okay? So it's just like uh, what you're hearing from me, well, through, if you ignore the mic. So it's just compressing and expanding the air or the uh, elastic medium through the like earth, that. okay? And S wave is a shear wave that actually shears the earth sideways, laterally, okay? But S waves can't travel through fluids, so I can't transmit an S wave through the air. Uh, but it can only travel it through a solid. Okay, but the S waves travel slower than P waves always. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, I promise you a stupid question, and since nobody uh, here asked it, uh, I've heard this asked more than a few times. Global warming, is that affecting the, uh, 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 seismicity? Uh, no. No. <laughs> the answer is no. That's, so, a, that's a quick so, answer. Not, yeah. that, <laughs> just a, not that we know of, it's a, almost certainly no. Yeah. Not in any major way. It's really the stresses within the earth are, are really, are, are much larger or, or much d deeper force than, uh, than something that's going to be very superficial. So we nip that in the bud. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Ryan, Bill, Andy, uh, let's give our panel a hand. And uh, we'll be around afterwards if you have any other questions. Books. And? Yeah, so Roadside Geology and Minerals of Georgia, he didn't mention that he's uh, uh, editor on. Right. And we've got, they're in the bookstore, and we'll be glad to sign them. And we'll be around for a while, so if you have a copy or if you want to go get a copy, we'll be right over here. Thanks. Thanks.